but doesn't china the, have the uh, biggest virology lab and all the uh, technology and science uh, with covid 19 are men more affected than women anything like that in terms of gender do you have but now the lab leak theory has become louder than ever so what is your take on that i can say that because no one knows how to do it it would be like i could tell you go engineer a virus what would you do you wouldn't know what to do i work with these viruses i wouldn't know much better one of the discoverers of OC43, which is one of the human coronaviruses. So he was around at the beginning. But I um, I became interested in this because I'm a pediatrician. And I was interested in how viruses interact with brains. And this virus, the, the mouse coronaviruses that I study, cause demyelination, which is so they infect the, the spinal cord. And when the virus is removed from the spinal cord, then you have destruction of the myelin. So it's similar to the human disease, multiple sclerosis. So I became interested in that because the virus seemed to be unable, the host, the body didn't seem to be able to clear the virus without causing a lot of tissue destruction. So that what really made me interested for the 20 years I worked on this before SARS came about. And uh, uh, so uh, if, if, I, if I'm getting it right, the earliest reports of coronavirus infections actually began in animals and they were from North Dakota uh, in the US in the late uh, 1920s, you know, in newborn chicks uh, with oh, IPV. rate of 50%. Yeah, so I don't know that it was identified as a coronavirus then. But because that, that required electron microscopy, but IBV was the first one to be identified. And that's, that's right. So that's even earlier than the human ones, earlier than any other one. That's correct. Right, right. So even though the spread that time, at that time, even though the spread was only among animals, yeah, the scientists in your country, in the US, were quick to study the spread and file a report as early as 1931. Yeah. So considering that history uh, and also the fact that, you know, these deadly human infections have been around since the 1970s, do you think China had difficulty containing the COVID-19 outbreak? I mean, they knew that it was there right i mean these viruses have been there since 70s did you do you think that china had difficulty in containing the covid 19 outbreak well you know you're dealing with a lot of different viruses so the viruses the human viruses that were discovered in the 1960s caused the common cold and they're everywhere in the world and certainly sars was present in china in 2003 so they had experience with one of these bad human coronaviruses. So that then puts you to 2019, December, when the virus was first found in Wuhan. And I think China initially didn't report that they had an infection very quickly. And then they, they allowed people to leave Wuhan. So they didn't contain it terribly well then. But right after that, they contained it very well. I mean, they locked down Wuhan for many, many weeks. So it would have been better if they had contained it better in the beginning. That's right. certainly true. Right. So there was a chance to isolate the virus in Wuhan itself. Had the scientists and WHO taken urgent, adequate measures? I mean, they could have isolated the virus at that time itself in Wuhan. Maybe. It's, it's, it's really unclear because um, there's now reports coming out that maybe the virus was actually uh, in different places in earlier than that, in the fall of 2019. Hmm. So if it was in other places... In October 2019, if, even if it had been recognized in Wuhan earlier in December, remember we're talking about it was the first case was something like December 10th, and recognition was about 20 days later. So it's not a huge amount of time. Certainly, in retrospect, those 20 days mattered. If they had locked down the city and prevented spread, maybe it would have done all the right things. Right. But there's also a chance that it was in other places at the same time. And so even if it's been stopped in Wuhan, it might have spread from some other place. These things are all so hard to know. All we know is that China didn't move quite as quickly as we would have liked, uh, that there was information they weren't sharing uh, days to weeks before they had it.
days to weeks after they had it rather you know these coronavirus has spikes right these spikes distinguish coronaviruses from the other common viruses right um, but not much is known publicly about the evolutionary aspects of these spikes what do they signify what is the role of spikes in making the virus deadly you know all viruses so all viruses do is they all have to attach to a cell and enter that cell in order to make more viruses Viruses have only one goal, which is to make more viruses and not a very profound goal. So as long as they can get into a cell and make more viruses, they're happy. So some viruses like coronavirus have, have spikes sticking out of the, out of the virus. Okay, like yeah, yeah. Other ones, yeah. And other ones like polio virus looks like this, but there's ridges that have the same effect that bind to the receptor on the host cell. So okay. they're, not, they're not spikes. That's, that's why they're not called coronaviruses because it's the corona after the sun, but um, they still can bind to a cell. So the spike protein itself is not, not terribly special. Uh, why, why people latch onto it as it were is because it's the protein that's used to enter cells. So if you can stop a virus from entering a cell, then you stop the infection. So there's just no infection whatsoever. So that's why if you take a mouse, mice don't get infected with SARS coronavirus too. So that's why you can take a mouse. And for the most part, you can take a lot of virus to put it in the mouse and nothing happens because the virus, even with that spike sticking out of it, can't find the right receptor to go into. Okay. So it's really key that it has the receptor and it's not, it's it, the spike is the target, but there's no reason to think that it's the spike is any different than the envelope protein of HIV or these other proteins on the cold viruses or polio viruses. They all have the same function and they're all, all the target uh, that if you want to keep the virus from getting into a cell, the best way to do it. Okay. Okay. So that furin cleavage site, that is a furin cleavage site. Yeah. Right. Can you explain the science behind it? Like how is it, how does it distinguish coronavirus? Yeah, so the way virus, so the way the coronaviruses work, so it has this S protein sticking up like this. And this, let's say this is the virus across this part of my finger. Yeah. So the for this, for the virus to enter a cell, this part of it, this lower part of my finger has to be exposed. And normally it's buried in the virus. And this part sticks to the to the protein on the host cell, then this um, falls off. So this part is now available. And then this refolds, and then this binds to uh, the host cell. Okay. So what the furin cleavage site does, every time a virus uh, enters a cell, this, this part of the protein has to fall off. If you have a furin cleavage site, it may be a little easier for it to fall off. Okay. But viruses that don't have a furin cleavage site do just fine in entering cells. So it helps it. If you take it away from the virus, it doesn't enter cells as well. But if you add it to a virus that doesn't have it, doesn't make it better. And if not, why? Like, do you think that the unique COVID-19 spikes or its genomes could be an entirely evolutionary aspect? I, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying, but what you oh. mean, but I don't think it's, I, th I think it's just part of what bat, these are all bat coronaviruses. And I think there's a, they have a whole range of them. And this is just one of the ranges. So I don't think there's anything special about okay. the, uh, this COVID-19 spike protein. Okay. Um, what's unique about SARS-CoV-2 is that it actually grows in our noses because the other severe coronaviruses only grew in the lungs, so they didn't spread as well. So because it grows in the nose, people who don't have symptoms can spread the virus or people who are about to get sick can spread the virus. That didn't happen with uh, SARS or MERS. That is also why asymptomatic people get the disease, right? That's, that's the logic behind asymptomatic infections. Yeah, it's the fact that asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic means they're going to develop in the next few days. They have virus in their nose and that can spread. Right. Uh, sir, in Feb February 2020, as in last year, in February last year, you had co-signed a letter to the Lancet, you know, saying that SARS-CoV-2 was not a bioengineered virus and condemned conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. But now the lab leak theory has become louder than ever. So what is your take on that? So two things. First of all, we have another letter coming out in Lancet, maybe tomorrow, saying okay. that we, agree, we we think we say the same things as we saw in February 2020. I'm not sure when it'll come out. It's been accepted and it's in press. 
So okay. it should come out very soon. The second okay. thing is the, the lab leak idea has really changed. So the original letter was written around bio, about it being engineered. But now people are saying, well, the lab leak means that a natural virus could have been in a lab in China and mm -hmm. released accidentally when someone yeah. just walked out of it. That's very different than an engineered virus. So we right. think it's still unlikely because there's no evidence for it, but it's obviously, not obviously, but it's much harder to disprove. I can tell you that nobody can engineer a virus because no one's smart enough. But what I can tell you is that somebody didn't get a virus while they were in a bat cave or in the lab and it happened to be there and there's no record of it and they walked out and infected people because that's much harder to disprove. You know, you could, you could get infected with COVID-19 tomorrow by somebody next door you don't even know is sick. I don't know if you've been vaccinated or not. Have you been vaccinated? I have been, yes, yes. Okay, yes. so you won't, but to other people who haven't been vaccinated will. And, you know, you just don't know them. So that's what this, this um, feels to me more like that, that there could be an accidental um, leak of, it's the same word, but it means something so different, such a huge difference between engineering a virus and one just sort of being on somebody when they leave the lab. And I don't think that happened but that's much harder to rule out. I can tell you that no engineering occurred. Yeah, that you can tell for sure that there was, it was not a bioengineered one. Well, but I, whether I, it's a lab leak or not, you're not really sure about that. Yeah, so I was gonna say for, in my opinion, in terms of the, where the virus came from, the natural variant is most, is, it, is the far and away the most likely ex explanation. And whether it was leaked by, whether that occurred because there was an animal in the market, an animal somewhere else, humans in the middle became infected and brought it to Wuhan, or somebody in the Wuhan lab brought it in, it's all a natural virus. And when I say that I can be sure that it's not an engineered virus, I can say that because no one knows how to do it. It would be like, I could tell you, go engineer a virus. What would you do? You wouldn't know what to do. I work with these viruses. I wouldn't know much better. I know how to do it, but I wouldn't know what to do. But doesn't it's China true. have the biggest virology lab and all the technology and science at its disposal to really yeah. engineer a virus? I mean, yeah, but you still have to know how to do it, right? I mean, if you have a you have the biggest factory in the world and you don't know how to build a car, you can't build a car, even if you have the biggest factory, right? So no, we do not know how to take one of these viruses from scratch. All we could do is if somebody, what you could say is if somebody had the virus in hand, almost the whole thing. Maybe they could do something to it, but they wouldn't know what to do because viruses are pretty perfect. So if you mutate a virus, we do that all the time in my lab. We change the virus. They always become weaker, but they never become more virulent. So it's, it's, it's a good idea in theory, but it's, it's very, very hard to do in practice. You know, but it's not isn't like that gain of function research, but that is what it is, right? They are making the viruses more virulent and they are being successful at it. So, yeah, but again, it's that they say they're not making it more virulent. What they're changing is they're putting they're, this part is is I I don't want to defend this part too hard because it's not what I do. But they're taking a virus that they know, and they put a different spike protein on it. Okay, that's what they're doing. So the gain of function is it now can infect a different cell. It's not you. You haven't taken a virus that never existed. You're taking okay. a virus that's well known and changing the spike protein. A very simple thing to do that. So it's, and it could be a gain of function because you could make the weak virus more virulent, but it wouldn't be SARS-CoV-2. You'd be taking a known virus and putting a known spike protein on it. So no, it's not magic. You're not taking an unknown uh, virus and an unknown spike protein and coming out with SARS-CoV-2. And this is, this is really hard. I think it's, it's hard for people to understand it because they, it gets mushed together with this accidental lab leak and making the whole virus from scratch. Right. So I hate the words because they're so imprecise and they mean different things to different people. Right, right. So sorry, but if I am understanding it clearly, um, they uh, they already if they already had a SARS-CoV-2 virus in the lab, they will take it and you know uh, like modify it or add the spike protein, modify it to mut mutate it further, and make it more virulent or not? Sorry, well, so yeah, so the, going through each one of your steps, they'd have to have the virus basically in the lab. Yeah. Then the second thing is they'd have to have a spike protein they thought would make it more virulent. Yeah. Then, and then the third thing is that they once they had that, if they had everything else, they could put it into the virus, but they wouldn't know what they were gonna get. 
I mean, it's not like they had the virus in front of them and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. You know, it's not like you're once following a recipe. Yeah. You want to make a good yeah. dosa, you do this, this, or this. You don't, you know, you have to, you have to know how to do it to begin with. Right, right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. So uh, with COVID-19, are men more affected than women? Anything like that in terms of gender? Do you, have you seen? Have yeah, you yeah, yeah. Men or? seem to get sicker with it. But, you know, there's a symptom. I don't know if this is true in India. Do women, do people in India lose their sense of smell? With, yes, um, yes. Lens yeah. of so women, taste and smell. Yeah. So women, that's worse for women than men. So men get sicker, but women lose their sense of smell and taste more. Okay. Meaning there will be more chances for men to be hospitalized than women. That's what you're saying. The yeah, severity yeah, yeah. of the disease. Why Why would yeah. that be? Sir? Any, any, any I don't think we really know. We, I think it has something to do with hormones. I think some of the female hormones are protective. Um, so, but it's really not, you know, we don't understand that. You're saying it from your observations in the US till now, right? Yeah, not only mine, but in Europe and elsewhere, China and everywhere, men get worse disease than women. Just like people who are older get worse disease and people who have um, diabetes or obesity, they get worse disease. Right. Um, uh, you said some of the ways uh, the U.S. managed the infection were less than ideal. In one of your interviews, you had said that some of the ways in which the U.S. managed the infection were less than ideal. So what are the lessons in management that you have learned so far? And uh, what would you suggest developing countries like ours to really, you know, the steps that we could take? Yeah. Yeah, I think that this there's so many things that one can learn. So, you know, so in the U.S., we had um, cases came into th from from wherever, China or Europe, very early, probably in, still in 2019. And so at that point, you have the first thing you have to do is you have to have a leader in your country who says we have a big problem. So neither the U.S. nor India had that. Both of them said this is not a big deal. And so that's the first thing. So you have to know the virus comes in and then you have to start tracing the people, you know, like they did in South Korea. Somebody was infected. They found out who that person was around, who they got it from, and they tried to trace the whole thing down. Not perfect. I mean, it's still cases, but that's the way you control it. Um, and so in the U.S., you needed to have um, tra tracing of the contacts and then figuring out where the virus was going, uh, where it came from. Then you have to be prepared in hospitals. You have to have enough, one has to have enough ventilators, uh, enough uh, protective gear so healthcare workers don't get sick. Um, and so you, and you have to have enough hospitals too. Again, the same problem that India's had recently. Yes. Yeah, yes. and not enough equipment and not, not preparing enough. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's all, you know, both of us, both countries were bad because in the US, we had warning. We saw what was going on in China. We should have been prepared. And India's had a year of warning before, um, before the, the major wave occurred, that occurred there occurred. So you, it would have been ideal to have a uh, better preparation in both countries right and and then how did you how do us come along i mean you know like what can we learn from from it like in the sense like what what steps measures do you suggest that we take i mean now most of you most of you have been doubly vaccinated right both the shots most of well, the population is, has been yeah yeah so the, no it's not most of the population it's in some places it's 70 percent, which is really good the average is only about I think 55 or 60 percent, maybe 62. Oh. So it's not there in my state. There are parts where only 25 percent are vaccinated. In Iowa. People, in Iowa, yeah. Some people won't get vaccinated. So in my city, every, a lot of people, maybe 80 percent are vaccinated. But in other parts of the rural areas, people don't. Why not? Other... Are they hesitant? Why, yeah. why, why are they not getting vaccinated? They're hesitant. They think that COVID-19 doesn't exist. They think the vaccine is a myth. They think it doesn't protect. They think it'll go into the DNA. There's all these things in the in, on the internet that are false that people believe. Right. In India, too, there are people who believe that. And that is why they are hesitant to come out to take vaccines. Right. Yes. But yes. I think when you get out to rural India, you, you have a lot of trouble getting people vaccinated. Um, some of the deep, the, the deep areas of parts of India. Yes. If it's like the U.S. anyway, they will not be happy to be vaccinated. Yes. Um, there are also some stories, sir, in Malaysia about a canine for coronaviruses. Yeah. 
a dog coronavirus is jumping directly from animal to people and causing pneumonia and children uh, can you tell me yeah. what, what what do you think about it I think it's an interesting story because it shows you how coronaviruses can jump. So these, the coronaviruses that jump are not, they're not the average canine coronaviruses. So if you, there's, if we have one coronavirus, one canine coronavirus is called type one, another one called type two. There's a cat coronavirus, a feline coronavirus called type one, a feline coronavirus called type two. And then there's a pig coronavirus called TGEV, transmissible gastroenteritis virus. So five different viruses, they all hop back and forth between dogs, cats, and pigs. The virus that crossed to people was a combination of canine coronavirus one, canine coronavirus two, and feline coronavirus one, I believe. So it was a cross of all of these. The, the exact virus is not found in nature. And then it did cross to people and cause pneumonia in, in eight children. Eight children in Malaysia. In Malaysia. And, we, and we, you know, the problem is when you only have eight children infected, you can't be 100% sure that the virus they find is what caused the infection. You want to find it in a lot of people so you can say it's not just there. You know, maybe the children all had the flu and they happened to have this other virus that did nothing there. So you want to, you want to make sure before we claim it's canine coronavirus, but I could believe it's going to be the canine coronavirus. So which is which is very dangerous, right? I mean, now we are going to be exposed to these coronaviruses. I mean, from- Right. We don't know. We don't know. So how come all of a sudden these these coronaviruses have like really taken over the world? I mean, now, now, now we are saying pigs and dogs and cats and bats were already there. And then there were chicks, I think that's what we spoke about earlier. Um, right. Right, the IBV, yep. Yeah, no, I don't think they. I don't think they're taking over the world. I think we we we're recognizing them. We okay. You know, if, we, if something happens, you don't know what you're looking for. You don't see it. When children get, I'm a pediat pediatrician. We used to have children who had pneumonia all the time, and we didn't know what it was. We said oh, it was just a virus. Well, maybe sometimes it was coronaviruses. Okay. Okay. So now we are able to recognize this be recognize it better. That's what you're saying. Right. 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 So you are into pediatrics as well, of course. Uh, how vulnerable are children, sir? Because uh, uh, they, you know, now there has been a, a, like WHO, I think, has said that uh, uh, you don't have to wear masks if you are a, a child below five years of age, as in children below five don't have to wear masks. And that, you know, now India is also looking at the third wave. You know, we are really very into. So, yeah, how what what are child what are the chances of children catching these infections and is it is it right to for them to not wear masks and yeah well i think it's, it's sometimes hard to get them to wear masks but i think that children there's some children who get very sick with this but the vast majority of children don't get sick so that's why we're a little lenient but we're also hoping to immunize ch children pretty soon we hope in this country you can get, get vaccinated if you're over 12 and we hope soon it'll be children between five and 12. And then after that, it'll be between six months and five years of age. That's what we hope. But you said most vast majority of the children don't get sick. Do they have inbuilt immunity? Because at times we say that they don't have immunity. At times we say they have a very strong immunity. So it's kind of fluctuating. Can yeah, you explain so the not, science behind could, that? Yeah, so we don't know. All we know is that children don't get sick. We don't know. Would they, I don't think they have specific immunity, so maybe their immune sy systems are stronger, but they don't have immunity. It's not like they've seen SARS-CoV-2 and have antibodies and responses to it. It's just that they have something that makes them less sick. Some people say it's aha because it's similar to the coronaviruses that cause the common cold, but um, there's not really very good data for that. So but that's a possibility too. So we don't know why children don't get sick. But the children who are between five and twelve are the ones who are least likely to get sick. Least likely to get sick. Least likely, yeah. Why? We don't know. I mean, that's what we'd like to know. Is it a combination of? Uh, we don't know. Is it because they have antibodies? Because they have a better immune system? I don't know. Okay. Okay. But it's but, an uh, important question. 
right right but there are there have been vaccines like for example pfizer i think there were reports in the lancet and in other journals as well that the vaccine was not really working because even after taking the vaccine children were reporting getting hospitalized um so sorry i don't am well, i too so, loud no i don't think that that's true i think that first of all pfizer is only approved for children 12 and older so it's not sorry, little yeah, older. 12 and older. Yeah, sorry. My, yeah, yeah. And the second thing is that the children, the, the protection after vaccination, I've seen all the data on that. It's really extraordinarily good. There's very, very few breakthrough cases after the vaccine. And the other thing to remember is if you had a vaccine in India where people still got sick, but all they had to, all they got was a sore throat and cough and a cold, we wouldn't care. People in India wouldn't care. What we care about is those people who are going to the hospital, ending up in the ventilators and dying. Mm -hmm. So even to people who break through the vaccines almost always have very mild disease. Right. So that's, yeah. yeah. The, the one exception is people who are immunocompromised, you know, who don't have good immune systems at all. They do poorly. Life in the US is coming back to normal slowly and gradually. Yes. Um, yes. But the pandemic is still booming internationally, right? I mean, we are looking right. at a yeah. third wave. Uh, do you have anything to say for, you know, how do we, how do you know, how, how do we raise the third wave? How do we take our chances or? No, no, I think all the things we've talked about, we share the vaccine as much right. as possible. Right. We get the, uh, the Serum Institute in the Bangalore, or wherever it is, to start making more and more vaccines. Right. Um, uh, and right. we and we still have people to think of social distance, wear masks to protect themselves as much as possible. Right. That's all you can do until everyone's vaccinated. Right. Right. Uh, Doctor Anthony Fauci said that the Delta variant of coronavirus found in India has proven to be the greatest threat to the efforts made by the US to fight COVID-19 in its borders. The transmissibility and so severity of the Delta variant is more than the original COVID-19 variant. So could you explain this please? And what are your thoughts about the Delta? Well, so the, so the one I think I agree with most strongly is this variant seems to spread easily. So if you or I are in the same room and we're infected with the alpha strain, the original strain, we have certain chance of you're infected or my getting infected. With the Delta variant, it may be twice as much. It's just, it, is, it either grows in your nose better or it spreads in air droplets better. That whether it causes more severe disease, I think is controversial. It may cause a little bit more severe disease, but not completely clear. Most importantly is it infects more people. So, you know, if you have a hundred people and one is gonna get really sick, and now you have a virus that infects 800 people, then eight people are gonna get really sick, even if there's no difference on a per virus basis. And the virus may be a little more virulent. So instead of that one in 100, maybe it's now 10 in 800, or instead of eight in 800, now it's up to 10 or 11 in 800. So it's a subtle, small difference in virulence, big difference in transmission. That's, that's why we want people here to get vaccinated. Right, right, right. Um, um, also, are lockdown measures effective? Because we had a lockdown right from March 2020 last year. India imposed a strict national lockdown, but the US actually did not do as much. So do you think lockdown right. measures are effective? Yeah, so, you know, lockdowns are, a lot of people think we should have had lockdowns. And, you, you know, the problem with India is they had a lockdown, but it didn't really know what to do with all the migrants who were and not in their yeah. hometowns. That was the, otherwise it would might have worked in India, but that was the big problem. All these people were infected, and they all went home and spread the infection. So, so lockdown seemed to work, but they come at great economic cost because people don't have jobs, <coughs> and they can't. They they just really it's very hard. So the lockdowns work, but they're not really, and they're only useful in some places, you know. And, China used them and some other, some countries in Asia and a part of Africa use them too. But you have to have people really pay attention and then you have to make sure that they have enough money so they don't starve. Right, right. Which, so we could have had a lockdown in the US. I think it would have worked brilliantly in your country. I mean, it don't really work as well in India, I think. Yeah. Right. Right. So in the late 1990s, we knew only two coronaviruses, right? There was an H COVID 229E and BC43. And OC43. 
Oh, sorry, O O C forty three. These manifested as common colds. Should we have paid more attention back then? This could not have happened, right? This SARS. I mean, is it? Is there a relation? If we would have done more research, or if we would have really. I think they. I think that that's probably not the line. Probably the point is in two thousand three when we had SARS. And we realized it was a bat virus and we realized there were other coronaviruses and bats that can infect people. Yeah. That's probably where we needed to spend more attention, but probably not 1990s. It's probably too early. Right, right. But you studied coronaviruses extensively in the 1990s when uh, it was not a big problem for humans at right. that time, right? Right. Right. Sir, one last. What do you think are the lessons from the pandemic in terms of global systems related to taxonomy and epidemic management? Yeah, so this isn't really my specialty, but I think what you what one learns is you have to one has to have uh, people who think about epidemiologists, scientists, public health officials all get together and try to figure out where the virus is coming from. How can we prevent its spread? Um, the important thing is to not blame of the people for it. That was, countries are still spending so much energy blaming this country or that country for it instead of working on how to make it better, make sure that the whole world can see the end of this virus. Because, you know, if, this, if the virus is all over Africa or India, nobody's safe. You know, people, people from India and Africa travel everywhere and there'll be new variants coming. So that's, that's the main thing I, th- I would hope that people would learn that, uh, the, the world is just one world. It's not that uh, 120 countries, 140 countries, whatever it is now. It's just one world. Right. Yeah. World without borders, actually. World, exactly. Yeah, yeah. For, especially for viruses. Viruses don't have passports. <laughs> That's true. Do viruses really, I mean, are they really beneficial to us? I mean, uh, what role do they play in the universe other than just, you know, really creating <laughs> havoc? In our lives. I, I can't I can't tell you I can think of any. If we if you never had a virus infection, I don't think you'd be worse off. I can't think of it, especially for these pathogenic ones. You know, there may be other ones that live in our gut that help us, but these if you never had polio and you never had a cold and you never had the flu, you would be just fine. Yeah, yeah, true. But in the gut we have bacteria, right? I mean, do we have viruses that are really beneficial for the human body? We might, I, you know. Well, we, we know we have back. We know we have viruses in the gut that infect the bacteria there. Okay. So there's phages, but I don't know if there's any. And once it, it doesn't, really, it wouldn't have infect the human body. It would do something that that would be beneficial, so that the virus would benefit and the human body would. But I don't really know of animal viruses that live there. I suspect there are some. They just don't cause disease. So that's the key thing. You know, it's just like bacteria can make you sick, but most of the bacteria inside of us don't make us sick. So these viruses wouldn't make us sick. Yeah. So there is just this, some of them that really do. Right. Okay. Um, I think we're done, sir. Just one okay. last, I think. Um, how do the in the brains of babies interact with the virus? I think you had spoken about this. So if you could just tell us more about it. I think in one of the interviews, we've spoken about the way babies' brains interact with the virus. Is that correct? Do they have inbuilt immunity to fight it? Well, the virus, the virus doesn't, this virus doesn't infect the brain particularly. So maybe, I don't know if you're referring to this... <coughs> So when I used to work with the mouse coronaviruses, they infect the brain, but that's mice. Okay, um, for people, coronaviruses don't cause infection in babies' brains, but other viruses do, and they cause usually such terrible infections. That's what really started me thinking about viruses in the brain, because babies who get a virus infection in the brain, it's often really, really bad. So, mm-hmm. so that that can occur, but it's different than this coronavirus one. Coronaviruses are weird because they cause this brain something in the brain, but there doesn't seem to be much virus there. Okay, do they impact the brain? As of now, there has been no. No, but people get brain fog. You know, you I don't know. If oh you, yeah, you, yes, you know, yes, brain, brain fog, fog and yes. other yeah cognitive defects. Yes, but yes. Th- thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you.